Now our next talk is hacking German elections, insecure electronic voting count, vote counting, how it returned and why you don't even uh, know about it. Um, for the Germans li listening here, do you notice? Did, did you notice that in Germany uh, voting became more electronic recently? Um, in case you are from outside of Germany, I do live in Germany and I did not notice that myself. Um, however, both of our speakers volunteered as election workers in Germany and researched on the topic of, of security for um, elections, and they promised to tell us um, how this can be, how elections can be made more secure again. Our speakers are Tobias; he's an IT security researcher focusing on offensive security, automotive security, and capture flag challenges. And Johannes; he's a postdoctoral. Um, IT security researcher, and both work together at the Fraunhofer um, ISEC Institute. Enjoy the talk. Hello, and welcome to our presentation on Hacking German Elections. Insecure electronic vote counting, how it returned, and why you don't even know about it. My name is Johannes Obermeier. And I'm Tobias Madel. We are both very much involved in elections in Bavaria because we are election workers and often support here in Germany. And we are offensive IT security researchers. First of all, we want to talk about the scope we are going to presenting today. We got our information and the software from today from the municipal elections in Bavaria happening in the early 2020 and it was a computer-based wound counting technology. So we were very concerned when we interacted with it. And in the end, we uh, featured the questions, are elections still secure? Next, I present you the outline we are talking about today. And first of all, we are looking at the electronic vote counting system. And next, we identified some conceptual and practical issues with this technology. Afterwards, we also inspected the software and found some insecurities. And in the end, we summary and conclude our presentation. To understand why we need electronic vote counting, let's just have a look at the voting ballot. This voting ballot is in its paper form about 1 meter wide and 50 centimeters high. So that's a quite a large ballot with a lot of candidates. Let's just sum up the facts. So we have a total of 599 candidates that are spread out over nine parties. Each citizen is allowed to cast up to 70 votes in this election. So that sounds simple, but it gets even more complicated now because you can cast up to three votes per candidate and you can even choose multiple candidates of different parties up to your 70 votes. And even if you decide yourself to vote for a single party, you can still strike out candidates that you personally don't like and so they don't get any votes from your ballot. That means this voting system gives a lot of power to the citizens and voting is fun. However, counting out those ballots is very difficult because you need to know a lot of special rules in this voting system to really count each ballot correctly. That's the reason that a software such as OKVote OK has been developed. OKVote OK is a typical software for elections that's also used in the polling stations for vote counting. So OKVote OK has a quite large market share. They say they have a like 75% in Germany. So that software is used in several states. OKVote OK has several different modules for organizing an election, for example, but what we will have a look at in this talk is only the uh, vote counting module of OKVote, OK where the election voters insert each paper ballot and manually type it in all the votes in each ballot and then they are stored in the computer system. So and the uh, task of OKVote OK is to process each, each ballot, to count the votes, to find out if the ballot is correct, 
then it stores all the ballots into its database and finally it does some magic and computes the final result. So this sounds quite similar to what a voting machine does. But wait a moment. Voting machines in my Germany? Wait, that's illegal. Is it really illegal? Let's have a look at the legal regulations about that. So, yes, in 2009 there was an important decision by the German Federal Constitutional Court and they said that the use of voting computers in the 2005 Bundestag election was unconstitutional because, for example, the voting computers were not transparently enough. So <clears throat> that uh, is very similar to that what we have also found for the municipal elections. But wait, we are here talking about the Bundestag election, but this is the municipal election. And we have different rules for the municipal elections. For example, there is the GLKRWO, that's the Gemeinde- und Landkreiswahlordnung Bayern, which basically translates to the Bavarian Municipal Election Rules. And those uh, rules say that we are indeed not allowed to use a computer for voting, but computers can be used for vote counting. So, and in this situation I would expect that we have some sort of security requirements there in those regulations, but I tried to find them and I was real surprised they are exactly zero. So, if there are no legal requirements, are there at least any software side requirements or certifications for OK Vote which promise some security? Yes, there are. So, I had a look at their website and I saw this nice little paragraph here and it says elections with security and during the development of OK Vote, they put the highest emphasis on the topic security. They follow the BSI and OVAS recommendations on security and they have a certified data center with very high security standards. And how does it look in practice? Well, I, I rather would not show you this here. It's, it's really scary. This was what okay. I have seen here when I walked in the election room. This is not a stock photo. I took this photo myself and this is the reality. So I walked up to the guys and said, well, shall we really use these computers to counter the election? And they said, yes, that are the computers that are available here. So, and I pray to God that this for some reason does not work out and Windows XP did not disappoint me because when I tried to start the software, it failed because that's a 32-bit system and OK Vote needs 64 bits. So yeah, that was, that was great. So we did not use that Windows XP machine. So instead we had uh, to search for another machine and came across this one here. That's a Windows 10 machine, that's fine. However, uh, it has an outdated virus scanner. So, well, it's, it's better than nothing. So this machine was used instead then. So, but just let's, Keep in mind what they are promising us, election for security, we really doubt that. Let's uh, now look at the IT environment and why it came to that situation. So first of all, this is not fully the fault of OK Vote because it's the task for the local administration to provide hardware for vote counting and the AKDB, so the uh, vendors of OK Vote say that they recommend to use secure administration computers. That's fine so far, but we simply don't have enough secure administration computers for that purpose. So for example, in the town where I'm from, we needed around eight computers to count out this uh, election and we simply did not in have enough in the town hall. And what's even more, <coughs> the election room, it was in a school and there are already school PCs available there so they were just using the school PCs. So, and those were even elementary school computers. So I'm not really sure about if all the pe pupils know which link they are allowed to click and which one they should rather not click on. So these systems might be insecure, they might be malware written, and even if it's possible that someone had manipulated them in advance. We cannot really exclude that. However, I don't want to blame the administration here. 
because it did a great job in organizing this election. It's, a, it's really much to do for them, and it did really well. So everything that worked out well uh, at the end. However, they are no IT security specialists, and we cannot demand from them that they know each detail on how to set up a system correctly and what are the risks that are associated with insecure computer systems in elections. That's just not their job. So, however, we still ended up with untrustworthy systems here because, as we have seen before, there are no re uh, legal regulations against that. Now let's see how we create a digital result. Exactly. So we went to our voting places. We were uh, presented with each one uh, got a PC and we got uh, the ballot stack. We had to count and then enter the results. So Johannes is team two and I was team one. And we started entering the, the ballots in the PC. And from this on, they were digitalized. Team one in green and team two in blue. As soon as I was finished entering my ballots, I put them on a USB drive and handed them over to Team 1. Exactly. Um, I imported these votes because I was the master machine at this time. And the OK vote software then finalized these uh, voting elections and exported their results finally again on a USB stick. And these were then delivered on for further proce processing. What is the problem with that all? First of all, there's a lot of intransparency. So, for example, the software that is being used for vote counting, OK Vote, it's not an open source software. It's closed source, and nobody was able to analyze this yet. So, and since this is closed source software, it is also very hard to understand how the software works and if it really counts correctly. Because we have, in the end, we have hundreds of ballots there, and it's really difficult to tell if they have indeed been counted correctly. So, and also we have seen this before, there is no basis for a secure vote counting if we have possibly rigged computer system. So we cannot exclude that someone has manipulated them pre-election-wise. So if there is some manipulation, this would hardly be detectable by a standard uh, election worker. So this means that the entire election process becomes very intransparent and hard to understand for a person who just wants to observe the election. So that is strictly against the idea of a public counting of votes. So now let's talk about the step that happens after where we finish counting in each of the teams. So what do you do after you have exported the final election results? How do they come to the central administration? Yeah, um, I've just entered my vehicle and took the USB sticks in my pocket and drove uh, to, to the master PC. But as you maybe know, election day is always a very busy day. And uh, my, some teams are slower at counting, some teams are faster. So uh, the master team doesn't know when these USB sticks arrive. If they take two or three hours or half an hour, they don't know really. So I could just go and grab something to eat on my way or I can manipulate the votes, I, I mean uh, deliver the votes. And yeah, in the end, when they when I arrive at the master PC, I just skip to my USB sticks, they enter it, and they take the data that is stored on there, and nothing else. And afterwards, they just upload the, the final results on the page. Now you might think, why is it possible for him to manipulate election results? Because there's no authenticity. There's only integrity protection of the files that he is transporting. So there's some CRC32 and a SHA hash, but nothing like a cryptographic signature. So even if he alters the data, he can just regenerate all the integrity protection data and the data will just be accepted. So the main issue here is also that this is one of the few spots where only a single person has unsupervised access to the data during transport or to voting data at all. And date makes manipulations possible and easily feasible in this case. And that should not be the case, especially in an electronically supported election. Now let's have a look at the vote counting software itself, because there we found even more interesting in results. Exactly. Let's begin with the system architecture. 
first of all, this is the local or decentralized uh, version of this uh, software system. So all this is taking place on the local host, in the machine we were encountered in the lecture rooms. And on these machines where was an Apache Tomcat web server running, which was connected to a MariahDB, and the user was interacting with the voting system via a portable Firefox. And as the AKDB said in before, they were very concerned with security. So let's think about what uh, attackers uh, are they had in mind when they designed the system and uh, from which the system is to protect from. Is it the user that maybe attacks the, the, the system, the vote count system, which is normally just election workers that are uh, on their free time there to help uh, executing the election? Or uh, are they having the network attackers in mind that come from completely different places and try to uh, manipulate the network from outside? First of all, we, we took the user as one of the possible attackers and even if in this environment we found some really broken stuff. First of all, broken access control. But how it's, uh, how it's all about? Well, that's the login page when we just logged in our um, voting system and clicked on administration page where we can change our password, uh, edit our profile. These are the buttons on the left. And as you can see, we are clearly logged in as the user 42. And there is no more things to do than select which counting uh, part we want to do the general uh, regional vote or the municipal uh, municipal votes and that's all we can do on this page. Now let's switch to the system administrator. There we have the admin account as you can see on the left upper side where we can now do very much more than the normal user. We are again on the administration page but now we have the user administration where we can create or delete users. We have to um, reopen or close voting uh, mechanisms, we have imports, we have exports, and also um, what's not included in the screenshots, um, submenus like deleting uh, finalized results or and so on. So we picked out two very interesting URLs for you. First of all, we are taking the Bezirk wieder öffnen, which is uh, translated just to reopen election. After election is closed, it normal, it's normally finalized, so no more uh, votes can be entered in the system. And the other link is election, uh, so uh, it translates to delete data, which then in the end deletes all the data from, from the machine, so uh, no more uh, private or secure data is stored on there. And this is what they look like when we, when we open them. On the left side, we see the reopen dialog, and on the right side, we see the data delete. But wait, this is not the admin view, this is the user view. So they did not check if this user is even allowed. And we also have to say that this is not just the, the, the view of it, it is fully working and it's completely functional when we just go through the process of deleting or reopening as an election. What's the problem with that? Yeah, as you maybe already guessed, reopening elections could create the probability of sneaking in some additional votes for the candidate I favor. And additionally, if I want to um, mess with all of uh, the voting, I could just delete all election data and we'll, you would have start to, uh, from the beginning and completely de delay or deny the voting. But why is this even possible? Um, yeah, we found out that this is their access control check in their software, and the, the, this uh, function is called get Zukunftsrollen, which translates to get access roles. So normally there would also be the software in place to check if this uh, role is uh, allowed to access this kind of site, but they just returned null and not implemented it, and that's also a nice work to implement uh, access control. Um, however, I think we can propose uh, some uh, mechanisms that could have prevented this. First of all, hidden information is nothing uh, you could rely on. If you just don't show where you can click uh, to get to this URL or to this page, that's not really secret because maybe you find some leaked source code or you make show serving at an admin or you just by accident uh, type in the wrong URL and get to this hidden information or you exactly use software scanner to find uh, something hidden. So hidden data is just not secure. And on the other hand, you should 
finalize your implementation of access control to be to have access control and even test it once to be sure that it works. So in the end, we can conclude that hidden data is not protected data. Let's now come to another type of attacks, cross-site attacks. A cross-site attack is a sort of interference between two websites, where one website, for example, tries to do something on behalf of the other. The goal is often to deceive the user or to trigger the manipulations. First of all, we were quite sure that I have thought of cross-site attacks, because uh, during our testing, we saw that they included some HTTP headers that target a wide range of attack vectors that use cross-site scripting attacks. For example, here we have an X-Frame options, same origin. That means that other pages cannot include the voting software into own frames and so on. And also cross-site uh, scripting protection is enabled via X XSS protection. So this looks quite uh, good because this already excludes several attack vectors. Well, but how about cross-site request forgery? When we first tested this, we found out that the uh, vote counting system is not fully protected against it. What is cross-site request forgery? So in the first step, the election worker uses the integrated Firefox browser to access a malicious website. So the user is triggered to visit this website. Uh, for example, someone sent him a link, triggered him uh, to uh, click on a link uh, by the promise, for example, of uh, cute admin mail pictures or some sort of that. And then the user visits, visits this website. And this website contains form fields that resemble the form fields of the actual vote counting software. And the malicious website now triggers the browser to submit this form data, not to the original website, but rather to the vote counting software. And as soon as it reaches the Tomcat web server, the uh, web server is confused because the uh, web server cannot discern the input from the cross site attack from the malicious website from original user input. And then the Apache Tomcat server just thinks that this is original user input and will process it. And that's called a cross site request forgery attack. So we saw that there is sometimes a protection against this sort of attacks, but many pages are not protected against it. And that is very concerning because that's a 2001 vulnerability. It's almost 20 years old now, and it's still present in such a software. So this is quite unsettling here. Now let's sum this up what we can do with it. So first of all, the issue is that they have missing CSRF tokens or any other good countermeasure against cross-site request forgery attacks. And the second point is here that only minimal user interaction is required. The user often doesn't even see that a cross-site request forgery attack is being, uh, currently being executed on his behalf. So it's almost undetectable by the user and it's very simple to trigger a user into clicking a link. So the impact is very devastating because we can now manipulate settings in the vote counting software and we can even insert fake ballots here. So what's, what's, what's the result of this? What we can do with it? Well, we can manipulate the entire election business. Let's just see the demo how we do this. Nice. We are already logged in into the vote counting system. Our username is admin321934. Now let's count some votes. As we can see here, these are all the ballots that we can enter. They are still empty since we haven't entered any ballots yet. So let's start. For simplicity, we just have two parties here. On the left hand side, we have the good party, who wants the best for their people. On the right hand side, we have the bad party, who wants to take power and is willing to even commit election fraud. Let us begin and enter the first paper ballot. The person has voted for the good party, so we enter this into the software. Now we save the ballot and go to the next one. Again, it's a vote for the good party. Let's enter it and save it and go to the third ballot. And again, it's for the good party. Let's save our third ballot. Now we go to the ballot overview and we look 
what has happened. As you can see, we now have three ballots that have successfully been entered. And next, let's check the preliminary election results. As we can see here, we have a total of three ballots that have been entered into the system. That's correct. Three ballots contain votes for the good party. That's also correct. And zero votes have been given to the bad party. That's fine so far. Next, I will show you what happens if I open a malicious website. This website will execute a CSRF attack and manipulate the election results. Let's just assume we want to take a break and simply browse Twitter. Okay, here we are. There's a cute cat picture and there's a link to even more of them. Let's just play along and get tricked into clicking that link. Oh, look at all those cute animal pictures. Look, a hungry rabbit, a monkey, a little hedgehog, and two cute goats and so on. And when we are done browsing, we close those tabs again and return to our bot counting software. What we notice now is that our username has been altered and we just got pawned. We were tricked into visiting this malicious website. The website executed a CSRF attack on the vote counting software and did some manipulations. Let's see what else has changed. However, our three ballots are still there, but now we take a look at the preliminary election results. What you can see here is that the number of ballots that are in the system has been increased to 8. We now have 5 additional ballots that were not entered by us. As you can see, the good party still has 3 votes. That is what we have entered. But now the bad party has taken the lead. They have 5 votes now. This attack has indeed manipulated the election results. This is really bad because we cannot even see those additional fake ballots that have been injected. However, we are lucky because we noticed it since we have expected this attack. But we won't notice it in every case. But what happens if we don't notice? Well, that happens. So, for this example, we just assume that Team 1 has three ballots that uh, they have entered into the computer system and Team 2 has 6 ballots that have been entered into their computer system. Now, Team 1 visits their malicious website and 5 fake ballots are injected into the election results. In this case, the attacker is very smart and injects the ballots at a location where the Team 2 ballots will be expected in the future. So, what happens now is, Team 2 exports their ballots and Team 1 tries to import the ballots of Team 2. And now <clears throat> the following thing happens. Because there are already ballots present at the location where the Team 2 ballots should go to, the import process is not fully successful and only a subset of the ballots are imported. So the majority of the ballots, in this case 5 of 6 ballots, are just discarded because they don't fit in the database anymore because that location is already taken by the fake ballots. So usually we would expect that this can generate an error message or at least a warning, but this does not happen. This is a silent failure of the software. And what's even worse is now that the sums finally are correct. So that means we have now have 9 ballots present in the system and 9 paper ballots that were initially available. So this looks like we have entered all the ballots and everything seems to be fine. So we will now close the election and generate the final result. And that is what happens now. As you can see, we have only 4 votes for the good party, but 5 votes for the bad party. So the bad party has won the election by manipulating the voting system using this CSRF attack. And that should never be possible because <coughs> this is not what we expect from a voting software. And in this case, the result is rigged. So, have you also thought about network vulnerabilities? 
Yeah, sure, that's exactly the other side of the coin. First we checked the election worker side for attacks, but now we checked the network side and scanned and analyzed the system uh, at first, and then we looked like this. Open ports everywhere. And as you can see, they fully exposed the Apache Tomcat and the MariahDB to each available network on the system. Uh, with this we thought, yeah, let's maybe try some newly discovered vulnerability which was currently uh, recently found in 2020 called GhostCat. And GhostCat is an attack against the AHP protocol from Apache. But let's check the, the Apache system and how it's built. First, the Apache has a web root which serves static uh, resources and HTML or GSP files. And additionally, it can include class files or class servlets which are uh, combined with these JSPs or HTML files and then serve to the user. So, we prepared our ADAP shooter with the URL of the web application, added the port, added a file, to file we wanted to read. In our case, it's a private test class file, because we have maybe what we could leak about this, but we'll see. And then we said we only want to read it, because there would even be the possibility to evaluate it and execute the code in it. So, we've done this attack, and ta-da! we got a result and this is the bytecode of the private test class. So let's just drop this bytecode in our cup of coffee and maybe we can pull out some source code from it. And yeah, that's what we thread out because why not just test your encryption mechanism with uh, the string, but this is not a common string as we later found out. This is the real root productive password of the MariahDB. And this was like... So, what's the problem? As you maybe clearly see, with this attack we could leak out uh, the login of the MariahDB and probably even more logins or passwords. And additionally, we could leak the whole source code over the network without ever accessing the, the PC uh, uh, in, the, in the election room. And this was only possible because they completely exposed all uh, machines and applications to the network and this should never be the case. So in result, how can this be prevented? First, you should never expose these unneeded ports to the internet because they don't even use the AJP pro uh, proxy in their application but just uh, left it on the uh, 0000 interface. Next, you should, keep your, you should keep your software up to date that if, you fi if some vulnerabilities were found you should not be uh, vulnerable to it. And last but not least, never use productive passwords as your unit tests, because that's not the best idea to do. Uh, in the end, to sum it up, uh, avoid at all costs any additional attack surface to prevent these kind of attacks, even if you don't know about them yet. After Toby has shown us a lot of interesting Apache stuff, I tested the database for its security. For the first analysis, I was just starting with the same PC where also the software was installed and I tried to gain access to the database. So I was coming from the host local host, I tried to use the username root and then I saw that I am asked for a password before I'm allowed to connect to the database. However, finding the password was quite trivial to do because all the stuff I needed to know for that was included in a class file and I was able to decrypt the password without any issue here. In that moment I realized that also the password that Toby has shown us before that he found with the GhostCat vulnerability is indeed the MySQL root password here. So after I had access to the MySQL system I tried to dump the user table to look which users are allowed to access the database. So and that is how the user table looks like. We have four times the user root and the user root requires a password if I'm coming from localhost. But wait a moment, here we also have the host PCI1939 and as you can see here there is no MySQL password statement. That means that someone coming from host PCI1939 is always allowed to connect as root and does not even need to uh, uh, provide any password for that. And that's really strange. So, what could happen from this? Well, 
Now, someone on the network can now do just some voting manipulation. That's quite trivial because as soon as I set my host to the uh, correct host name, I get full access to the database where all my local voting results are stored. And since I moved, I can interfere with them. I can change them however I want to. And this vulnerability is so severe and uh, trivial. It takes me no effort to do this at all. And so we won't go, even go into a demo here because it's so stupid simple in this case. Usually I would say that's enough for today because we already have full access to the voting system and can change whatever we want to. However, this time we decided to go deeper because we saw PCI 1939 as a real door opener. So we have access to the voting results, we can change them, but we still don't have access to the entire voting system. So what about the PC? Might it be possible with that root access to the database server to gain remote code execution at that machine? So for this experiment, I used the following setup. On the right hand side, we have the voting system with the exposed MyIRDB database server. In the left hand side, that's my system. I named myself PCI1939 just because I can do it. And I establish a connection to the MariaDB server. I use root as a username. I don't need any password. And it is immediately accepted. So now that I am connected, I'm allowed to issue commands. For example, I can now instruct MariaDB to enable one of its plugins. This plugin is called HA Connect. It's one of the plugins that usually come directly with MariaDB. And this is a very powerful MySQL storage driver. So and now I will show you what I can do with that storage driver. So at next, I will now create a table that's called PWN. And I'm using the HA Connect storage driver. And I instruct the storage driver to create a file that's called pwn.dll and to place it right into that plugin folder. There is nothing that stops me from doing so. So that is one of the special features of the HA Connect storage driver that I can just say this table is mapped to that file in the file system. However, this file is still empty because the table is empty. But since this is a database, I can now just issue insert into statements and load whatever data I want to, for example, some malicious DLL. I can just load into the table via that insert into statement and then it is directly written into our malicious DLL, pwn.dll. Okay, so at next, I after I've finished writing, I will instruct MariaDB to enable this plugin that I have just uploaded. And enabling a plugin means that we are executing the code that is stored in this DLL file. So and that means we have remote code execution. I don't even ask what you can do with remote code execution. <laughs> Well, I can do everything. So that means I have now gained full control over the entire vote counting system. So I'm not only talking about the data in the database, I'm talking about the entire computer that I can now fully control and manipulate however I want to. And that's possible only by using the voting software and accessing it over the network interfaces that it has exposed. And now I will show you how simple this is to execute an arbitrary program on the system. This is the vote counting computer system. To begin, let's start the vote counting software. Now, the Apache Tomcat web server and the MariaDB database server are being launched. Finally, the Firefox portable is started. The system is now ready for operation. But beware, the attacker becomes active. His hostname is the infamous PCI-1939. Immediately, he launches the Python attack script fun.py. It connects to the MariaDB server as root without password and uploads a malicious DLL plugin. When the upload has been finished, the malicious plugin is executed. As we can see, the calculator was started, thus remote code execution was successful. 
The vote counting computer system is now under control of the attacker. After we have found those devastating issues with the vote counting software, we immediately notified the vendor AKDB. And they were very professional about it and responded very quickly to our uh, initial emails. So we, we really liked working together with them and um, telling them our results and they were always, always, always positive about it. So they also recommended some fixes. So for example, they told us you should only use that voting software in a secure environment like in an administration uh, network. However, we don't really believe that this is a good solution. Exactly, and we're not very happy about this proposal because um, we have two problems that still arise even if it's in a secure environment. First of all, um, an administrative PC could still be uh, infected with some malware or it could be manipulated before uh, the uh, election takes place. And in the second hand, we had this bug with the broken access control, do you remember? And even if you would have been in a secure environment, this bug would have been totally worked and you could have completely deleted all data work or reopened elections or something like this. But we are still quite happy that they took us seriously because they even have announced updates. So for example, they wrote us that they are planning on adding CSRF tokens for the pages where we found cross-site vulnerabilities. So that's already a good step into the right direction. So now let's summarize what we have presented today. So first of all, we discovered several problematic aspects in the concept and its practical implementation. So first of all, the entire voting system, it's running on untrustworthy computer systems. They could have been manipulated beforehand, they could have malware on them, or they just could not just function correctly. So that's already very problematic from the beginning because we have no underlying trust that we can put into those systems and we are using them to count out our votes, to count out the entire election. So what's even more is that even if we use the software and the PC uh, that the lies beyond it is secure, it still has not enough transparency. It's very hard to understand what the software is exactly doing and how is it doing this. So I cannot really understand how does it come to its result. Please keep in mind that we have almost 600 candidates and several hundreds of ballots that have all to be input into that computer system. And then some magic happens and it spits out its result. So then we just have to take this result because it's just impossible to check if really each vote has been counted correctly or if there anything strange has happened or any manipulation took place. And this is also possible because we found lots of vulnerable software and not just the system security was affected, but it was also absolutely possible to manipulate the whole election from very uh, many parts in the network and this lets us uh, to conclude that these elections are the high risk with this technology. So and this is the reason that we want you as election worker. The more eyes are looking at the election, the more secure it becomes. And if you are interested in becoming an election worker, just get into contact with your local administration. They are always very happy to have volunteers who want to take part as election workers. So, and from my personal experience, I'm doing this for several years now, it's also a lot of fun. You get into contact with a lot of people. So I enjoy this a lot and I can just recommend it. And this is a good way uh, how every one of us can support the democracy in their country. So to conclude our talk, we found out that security in this technology is really bad. And that's not all of it. So this is just the tip of the iceberg because we looked only at one of the solutions that is available for vote counting and this was also in a special configuration. So <clears throat> what is even more difficult to say is what happens behind all the stuff we have seen today because when we uh, export the data and uh, bring it to the central administration and the data is imported and uploaded, so where does all this data go? Where are all the results from all these from all um, the polling stations are summarized? 
we don't know that yet how this works. We don't have the software that we can analyze. So there is still a lot of work that has to be done <coughs> here to really check the entire system. We just took a look at a very small portion and that is just the vote counting software here. Next, we were very shocked that this information, that vote counting is already uh, shifted to software is not publicly known. And this is also why we, we created this talk today as this is an information that is crucial for uh, the democracy that uh, there is already this software in use and it is not really secure. So this was a big uh, uh, thing for us to, to uh, keep uh, bring it out to the people. So, and one other thing is everything that we have seen today is entirely legal because at least in Bavaria, we don't have any rules or any laws against the use of unsecure computer systems, of unsecure vote counting software. So as we've seen in the beginning, we only have very rough legal guidelines where it says, well, you can just use computers for vote counting. But we need stricter guidelines here because it cannot continue as we've seen it today. And in other states in Germany, there is sometimes, sometimes something like a uh, let's say guidelines or even certification process for such digital software. But in most states that I had a look at, there are no rules at all. And that is nothing that should continue in the next years that way. Additionally, in the end, before any of the software to electronically count the votes should go live, unbiased tests for everyone should be available to prove themselves that this software is secure and this software is doing what it's promising to us because it is directly influencing our democracy and if this software is manipulated it manipulates our voting our election and our democracy so in the end we can just leave you with two questions how much digital support is required and how much is tolerable Thank you very much for the interesting talk, Johannes and Tobias. Um, and thank you very much for your work on the topic. Uh, I hope you do have time for a little Q&A as we have quite a few questions actually. Sure. That is okay. All right. Um, so the first question from the internet is, is there any suspicion that these vulnerabilities have been actively used? Well, it's very hard to tell. So at least for the town that I'm from, I did not notice any um, yeah, special occurrences there. So however, I don't have an overview of my entire Bavaria. So that's quite hard to tell. I think it's even impossible to tell if there were any manipulations so far. So unfortunately, we cannot say that. Additionally, we just uh, um, at one place in, in this whole system, so we don't have an overview if there was any mismatching numbers or there any uh, other influences that happened, but that we didn't see at the moment uh, because we were just at one position in the system, at one station of the of the election. Okay, uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, do you believe that it is possible to have a digital vote that is as secure and trustworthy as physical or paper-based voting is? Well, in my opinion, that's not possible if you want to have the same sort of transparency um, that we have in a paper-based voting system. Because when we have paper-based voting, we ch can just go into the voting room and watch what's going on there. We can see the ballots that are handed in, the ballots uh, that come uh, out of the box, then they are counted, are summed up. I can really try to find out what's going on there. I can uh, have a look at that, understand what the people are uh, doing there. But the moment that we, I have only a digital vote, I cannot really find out if the computer is doing the right thing, if there were some manipulations. So in terms of transparency, I don't think it is possible in the same, uh, yeah, in the same way uh, as in the paper-based ballots, for example. 
Um, I would have to add uh, uh, to this, um, if there would be the possibility to get the same traceability and uh, um, visibility that you can always see uh, which results uh, came from from which position and if they're signed and very transparent, then it would maybe be possible in any future, but not with any kind uh, of this software we saw there. All right, thank you. Um, do you by any chance know which states in Germany use the software um, OKVolt okay as far? We cannot directly say which states uh, actively use them because we only took place in the elections here in Munich uh, or mm -hmm. Bavaria. Uh, but we can tell that we found uh, very much hints in the source code that they were um, also used in, uh, for example, Hamburg, Bremen, Hessen or Rheinland-Pfalz. Um, but uh, we don't know uh, if they were already uh, used there, or if the, if it's planned to be uh, to be used there, there or if they uh, did they already use them in the past elections and uh, decided against them for future ones. We don't know that about this exactly. Okay, uh, maybe we can stay for a second on your job as a um, uh, election uh, worker. Um, the process of manually um, entering data into the system. Um, is there a process for this? Do you have an idea on the on the risk of this part here? Yeah, so it's uh, basically the thing that um, there are at least two or three people sitting in front of each computer and then they are entering each ballot. So people are really cross-checking that the ballot has been entered correctly. So it's like one person has the ballot in front of him or her and the other person reads the uh, votes and the other person types it in and they are cross-checking each other so that there isn't any error during typing in those um, election results in the computer. All right, thank you for the elaboration. Um, someone is asking, are the systems connected to the internet or some other network? Um, if the understanding of your talk was correctly received by, um, by that person, uh, the results are written to some physical medium which is turned in to transmit um, the results, so you sense something physically. Um, so why care for the Windows version or the uh, that is running on these machines? Is that correct understanding? Well, the problem with that is um, that it depends on the local administration how they set up their uh, computer systems. So um, I also read this in the chat here. Someone has uh, written that they had their voting software in an yeah in a very limited network uh, yeah connectivity so um, the computer was not uh, connected to the internet however it depends very on the administration and on the computer network that is being used there so it is entirely possible that computers are connected to the internet because there are no guidelines on how these computers are allowed to be set up so I cannot fully ex uh, exclude this. So, and if someone, for example, just enables the wireless network or connects to some unsecured hotspot, they are connected then. So it's, it's uh, hard to tell here, but I would not exclude this possibility. Uh, to extend the answer, we even try to find out if there is any software side protections that checks if there is an internet con connection present and would then deny this voting system, but uh, there wasn't, a, or at least we couldn't find one. So even if the administration was not advised uh, if the uh, PCs should to, uh, be disconnected from, this, uh, uh, from the network, there isn't even a security mechanism in place that would check this and stop it or would even uh, show a warning that this is connected and they should be disconnected from the Internet before the counting can begin. Interesting. All right. Um, we have one message on the IRC from someone who worked with these, uh, this particular piece of software in demo mode um, by themselves, obviously. And the question they have is, um, did you notice a possibility to enter negative votes for a candidate? So saying minus two votes, for instance. Well, that's, that's difficult to tell. I thought about if this is possible so perhaps uh, you might have to manipulate the database directly um, so I'm not entirely sure I'm not sure if I tried this out this one 
So, um, but however, as soon as I have data, uh, as I have database access, it's entirely possible to manipulate anything. So, um, well, we could try this out again. Um, however, I don't think that it changes much in our result. So, mm, yeah, that's an interesting question. So far, I cannot answer this right now. So I'm not sure, Toby, have you tried out something like that? Mm, we've tried manipulating um, some already submitted uh, votes, but I think this was not, was not really possible. However, you, as you showed, when you export the data and import into the main PC, the uh, votes that were already in place, possibly by an attacker, uh, would then discard the newly imported votes, so this would probably replace this data and these votes um, but via the web interface I think it was not possible however we found enough vulnerabilities with database access that um, you could do it by this way if you want to all right thank you for all your explanation um, out of pure curiosity people ask how did you get access to the software in the first place to carry out your analysis well, that, that's a good question here, because uh, there's a nice story behind that. So, um, I was a lecture worker, and I was supporting, setting up the uh, system and so, uh, doing some IT support in the evening. And at some point, we tried to merge our results, so we exported the results from one computer to move them to the other one. However, the import failed, because there is some artificial limitation in software, so as soon as you're export files are larger than 10 megabytes, they cannot be imported anymore. So this happens quite quickly when you have a few hundreds of votes or a few hundreds of ballots, and then the import doesn't work anymore. And I had a look at this file, and it was just a JSON file with a lot of white space. So I copied all this stuff to my computer to fix this. And there was also later on a software fix that was published by the software vendor. Um, However, then I had the software on my computer just because I wanted to fix this election and it was really late at night. Then I returned home and I noticed, oh, I still have that software on my computer. Let's have a look at this. <laughs> so, yeah, it was just by, by chance. So I, I tried to, uh, to fix something, got all the software on my PC, and then I had it ready to analyze, even with some um, yeah, data on there, though, that I really knew how this uh, works in practice. And yes, but if someone would uh, try to gain access to that software, that's quite simple, because they could just restore the deleted data from one of the computers that are in the schools. Perhaps someone doesn't even delete the election software from their computer uh, in the school, or um, some person could just steal one of the USB sticks that have been used for installation. So um, I don't even think that uh, that would uh, be noticed then. Interesting indeed. Uh, you mentioned in your talk that uh, the software is certified by the BSI and that they claim to be certified by the Open Web Application Security Project. But uh, how could such a broken system be certified by these parties in the first place? And what, what's wrong with the certification process? Yes, this obviously happened. I mean, like, why, why not use a certified... Why do we use certified software in the first place if it gets certified even if it's broken. I think the first point about this is that we already mentioned in the talk that there are no legal requirements. You don't need any certification that your software can be used in, in our voting and our elections here in Germany or in most parts of Germany. And additionally, this, uh, this, this screenshot we show where with the OWASP and the BSI was just a promotion of the AKDB uh, for their software, but uh, there, I think there was no real certification attached, so we don't know if the BSE ever saw this software for real or if they just put it on there and said, yeah, BSE certifi certified or uh, with the BSE standards in mind. Like, um, they already have the, the IT Grundschutz and they maybe tried to implement after the, after this technology or after after the system uh, architecture but uh, the bsi never checked on it so i don't think there is any real certification for the software so just to add a few details here um, that's not really a certification there they just said that they follow the bsi and OS guidelines i think that was also the wording that was used on the website so there's no real certification behind that so far Thank you for the answer. 
Um, do you know by chance how the uh, municipalities publish the election results? Well, um, I don't know in detail how it works. So when we handed in our election results, they got uploaded onto some other software. Um, and that's also the end that I've seen. So they're ended in the computer system and they're electronically transmitted. And that, uh, first of all, it generates a preliminary result. And finally, there's a final result generated. But however, I don't really know how this works, but the election results that were generated with OK Vote are definitely going into the final result. So perhaps there's also some paper-based uh, protocol between that. I don't really know if they're using this, uh, the data that's in the computer or the data that is on the paper, but however, it doesn't change very much here. Okay. Um... Jumping over here a bit, um, the last question would be, uh, what do, in, in your experience, how practical and expensive are hand recounts here? And did, did you observe these? Um, I think this is very different from uh, election to election and from city to city. If this uh, is a, a rather small town, you could probably easily re-elect all, all, all the votes and um, uh, recount the votes. Uh, but if this is a big city like Munich, for example, with millions uh, of votes uh, uh, and you would have to recount this this would particularly delay the the voting or the result pretty much and this could have really bad influences if this would happen that the software has shown that uh, it has kind of manipulation happened and they had to recount all the stuff by hand again so counting this by hand is indeed very, very effortful because they have like 70 votes per, per ballot and even summing up all that is still error prone if it's do, uh, done by hand. So it's difficult to do that and up to my knowledge it's not generally recounted after the election. So I tried to find something in the internet um, regarding that and I just found um, some PDF um, where they said well, it's not practically feasible to recount all the election results and all the ballots. So let's just rather do a, a meter level check on is the protocol complete? How about special ballots that were not really clear and so on? But it's not like every ballot will be recounted as far as I understand. Okay. Oh. Thank you very much, Tobias and Johannes, for answering all the questions. Thank you again for your talk. Um, Thank you. Thank you.